us know you're here and you need to sneak out early, that's totally fine. Um, but feel free to add your name and um, affiliation in the chat. Um, we will be kind of opening it up for a discussion at the end of this afternoon. So if that helps you to kind of get to know who's in the room um, based on the questions you're planning on asking, feel free to utilize that chat feature. Um, I have my colleagues in the room with me um, that will be helping me um, today. Um, both Kim and Ben are present and are here to help with any sort of technical issues. If I don't see your chat pop up because I am sharing my screen, um, try not to double task too much. And um, with that, also, as Kim mentioned in the um, chat, we're going to be recording this just so we can post it and other people who may not be able to be here right now with us can share it later. So with that, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Micah Leonard. I work for Texas A&M Transportation Institute, and I am a part of the Texas Pedestrian Safety Coalition like leadership team, I guess you could say. Ben and I co-lead this along with um, Stephanie as well as Kim, and we have a lot of help from the rest of our TTI colleagues on making this a success, as well as our task force and all of the coalition members. Um, so today we have a really special um, engaging conversation and it's the role of law enforcement in pedestrian safety um and with that we have two of our researchers from texas a m neil johnson and joan hudson um, as well as a law enforcement officer himself um, to give kind of that law enforcement perspective um, before I kind of introduce them more formally, um, I did want to mention these conversations were prompted by a lot of internal conversations, both from the coalition, the task force, and some um, direct members of the coalition who had mentioned some of these um, findings, I guess, or curiosities that have been um, coming up in a lot of their um, outreach efforts. And that's really that perspective of how we can get law enforcement more engaged in the activities that we're doing in the pedestrian um, coalition. And previously, we've had a lot of engagement from the law enforcement. Um, obviously, over the years, things change and we've had a little bit less in the past. And so we're really, really thankful, obviously, um, Sergeant, that you could be here today. Um, and that we're kind of getting that ball back and rolling and getting more of that conversation started once again. So with that, um, I have the pleasure of introducing um, Neil Johnson. Neil Johnson has been at uh, TTI or Texas A&M Transportation Institute since 2014. He has led several TxDOT projects focused on traffic safety for vulnerable road users, particularly pedestrians and bicyclists. Neil has supported research on pedestrian crossing devices and conducted field studies on driver compliance with yielding laws. His research has been presented at major conferences such as TRB, Lifesavers, um, and as well as the highway safety priorities. Neil also serves in advisory boards, including the Bryan College Station MPO Active Transportation Advisory Panel. And if you haven't ever had a chance, um, both Joan and I are stars in many of Neil's um, videos online. We can add that chat, that little link later. Um, my boyfriend gets a kick out of me in those videos. I hope you do too. Um, as well, and then also today we have Joan Hudson, who has been a researcher at Texas A&M and Tex Transportation Institute since 2001. She specialized in bicycle, pedestrian, and transit safety with over 30 years of experience in traffic engineering, including 11 years with the City of Austin Transportation Division. Joan brings a deep experience in transportation effects and quality of life. Her work is sponsored by organizations such as TxDOT, so welcome to all the TxDOT and thank you for supporting us as well as the coalition, um, and the Transit Cooperation Research Program and the National Cooperative Highway Safety Research Program. She focuses on design and executing research to improve transportation for all safety and safety for all users. And last but not least, Scott, thank you for being here, Sergeant. Um, Sergeant Hewitt has been with the Texas Highway Safety Patrol, so, sorry, Texas Highway Patrol since 2005 and has served on the state crash rec reconstruction team since 2015 at the Transportation Code Program Coordination for the Texas Department of Public Sa Safety, DPS. He oversees DPS 
uh, fleet crash reviews and ensures the consistent application of the Texas Transportation Code. Sergeant Hewitt has developed two key resources in assisting officers in traffic safety enforcement and crash investigations, one of which is a 292-page field enforcement guide. There will be a quiz after that, that you all have read it. Um, and a 145-page contributing factors um, crash investigation manual. He has authored a 80-hour um, Texas Commissioner on Law Enforcement, DCOL, accredited courses on crash contributing factors, which has been delivered thousands of law enforcement officers statewide. His contributions have been greatly improved the uniformity and accuracy of crash reporting across the state of Texas, earning him the Medal of Merit. And I almost don't even feel qualified to introduce any of the three of you, but I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over the mic um, to Neil. And like I said, um, we will have time at the end for any moderated discussion. If you need to keep track of your thoughts, feel free to put them in the, ch the chat, but we will give you guys a space at the end of um, today's session. So thank you guys all for being here and thank you, our speakers. All right, thanks, Micah. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm really going to start off by ta just talking about our law enforcement training course that we designed here at, at TTI. Um, and that's along with Joan and some other people here at TTI that have helped us create this. And so that's where I'm going to start the conversation. And then, um, well, like, like uh, Micah mentioned, then we'll have um, Scott give some give us his perspective, and then we'll have a more moderated discussion about everything. So to start with, I um, just want to give a little bit of background on the on the training itself. Um, it is a TxDOT funded project, so it is funded through tech, by TxDOT um, through the Traffic Safety Program. Um, it's an, we are now in the sixth year of the project, or just wrapping up our sixth year of the project. Um, and it's kind of evolved over the years to starting with um, more of the legwork to get the course up and running. And then now we've been actively out there doing a lot more uh, trainings over the past couple of years. And then, and also I want to emphasize that we, in our training, we talked uh, strictly about the state laws. So I know there's lots of discussion about different ordinances that different cities or other jurisdictions may have um, and how that affects pedestrian safety more specifically. Um, but we are focused on the state laws, and uh, but we do always, of course, make sure and let people know, especially when we're in a specific area, that they should be looking at those local laws to see if there's any other uh, regulations they should be aware of. And uh, we, uh, over the, in the past couple of years, we've been able to offer uh, TCOL credit, or uh, as Micah mentioned, that's the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement credits uh, that we're able to offer through our partners um, at TEKS. And so we're able to offer that credit to the people that do attend our training to the officers. Um, and we've seen that that helps um, make it a little bit more, a little easier to get people to want to come to our trainings when they can get credit for it, for that, for attending our training. That's a little bit of the background of what we do. And I, so then what I want to get to next is a little bit more of the details about the trainings and um, then go from there. So over the past six, uh, uh, what I listed here is the last four years. Um, that's mainly because that's most of the training has been doing is the last four fiscal years. And so these two maps kind of show where we've been doing our trainings. So uh, the one on the upper right is the different locations where we've had trainings over the past few years. Um, so of course we've hit the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the Houston area, the I-35 corridor, and even a few out in Western Texas as well. Um, but then we've also had several other uh, people from different jurisdictions to attend those trainings. So the map on the lower left shows all the different agencies that we've um, had been part of our trainings at some point. And so in terms of the content that we cover, uh, this is, gives a broad overview of what we cover. I don't need to get, I'm not get, gonna get into too much detail on this. But we do talk about key definitions, such as this, uh, the definitions of a sidewalk and crosswalk, which are very essential to pedestrian safety. Um, and then also the regulations around pedestrians and also bicycle and micro mobility users as well, because it is a uh, we do cover pedestrian as well as bicycle. 
issues and of course micromobility, which kind of fits in there as well. We also talk a lot about right of way and the different right of way provisions that are that are talked about in the transportation code and other where and elsewhere in the law. And then I would talk about shared use paths and how that affects safety um, and the regulations around them. Some common violations that we've seen based on crash data and contributing factors of crashes, um, emphasizing that importance of crash reporting. Um, as was mentioned in the bio uh, for Sergeant Hewitt, you know, we're, we also have an emphasis on crash reporting as well, making sure those crash reports are as accurate as possible. And um, we do talk about electric bicycles, which of course are an emerging um, thing that are that is out there now. Um, we also talk about the difference between a vehicle and a motorized conveyance and how those are treated in the law and how those the different vehicles you may see out there or conveyances you may see out there are treated. And then um, an emphasis on prioritiz prioritizing safety risk and any enforcement that you're doing. So one thing I want to make sure that to mention, especially to this group, is that that's one of the things we emphasize in our trainings is while we want to increase enforcement and we do emphasize enforcement um, to increase pedestrian bicycle safety, we want to make sure that we're prioritizing those safe, those riskier behaviors and enforcement uh, and make sure we're using our resources for the best benefit. Um, and also to make sure that we're not just um, looking at the behavior of people walking and biking, but also the drivers as well, and making sure that they're part of that equation in terms of their, the safety on the roadway. And then at the end, we always conclude with um, an, a video we did a few years ago about how to conduct pedestrian safety enforcement. It's actually a little bit of a training video about how a uh, jurisdiction, how, how it, an agency might decide to do a driver yielding um, compliance te um, enforcement initiative. So it gives a little instruction how to do that um, and other things like that. And then, of course, when we're at the trainings, we also give them lots of resources. We have handouts to give to them and that they can take with them. Um, we also provide, which includes uh, a handout they can use when doing enforcement, but also um, a new guide that talks about those different the differences between those um, can the vehicle the vehicles versus motorized conveyances and how they're treated in the law and other details like that. The next thing I wanted to share is talking a little bit more about the results of the of the trainings that we've uh, gotten so far. So first thing I want to point out is our we do have a pre and post test for all people that do attend our training. So uh, I put the averages from our uh, FY 2024 grant that we just finished. Um, the pretest average score percentage correct of the officers is about 67 percent at they as they come into the training, and then as they leave, the average post test score is about 86. Um, and so you can see there's about a 20 percentage point jump there in terms of knowledge, which I think really uh, just it just show that there's increased in knowledge on, on the on the front of those officers, and emphasizes why this is a very important training to get, make sure they have that knowledge. And the and we also have evaluations at the end, so they can evaluate the training itself, the content, um, the instructors, and what they learned from the course. And the evaluation averages are about a 4.7 out of a five scale on average. And I should also mention that um, these the trainings are done. I am I co-teach them with Joan, and so we'll and we'll be talking, and Joan will be joining more of the conversation in our question and answer period to talk more about. And answer more of the questions about the training. So this year, one of the things we did is we wanted to take a look back, uh, kind of go beyond the evaluations that we did that we do every year and after every session. And we went back to participants that we have trained back to as far as three years ago. Um, and what we wanted to find out from them is, OK, now that you've taken the training, you've had a chance to get back out there, use this information and use it in your everyday life. And uh, when you're out doing enforcement and other activities, how has this information helped you? So these are just uh, four things I wanted to point out that uh, that we uh, metrics that we can point to. So over half of them say they often or very often use the knowledge from the training as part of their job duties, which I think is is good. Um, and of course, it'd be better if there's more of them, but I think it's still good that most of them are still trying to use it at, at some point. But they most of them had a chance to put that into practice at some point 
and they're much more confident in conducting enforcement and also when again when completing those crash reports. So those are very important things and metrics to see that that from our past participants, they've been able to use this information and improve upon their knowledge to um, and use that in their job as they go forward. So I know one thing uh, when we were setting, talking about this webinar, we wanted to also touch on is some of our interpretations of the law. Uh, since of course we're basically using the transportation code as the, most of our guidance for this course, uh, there's lots of interpretations of that law and how it's being interpreted. And so these are the three primary issues that seem to come up when we talk about, about the laws and some of the interpretations of the law. So we talk about the, the, the definition of a sidewalk, the definition of a crosswalk, and then um, bicyclists using the sidewalk. Um, and so those are, the, those are the three major things that we've identified. And um, I kind of want to, so I want to point those out. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those really quickly um, in terms of how we talk about them in our training. Um, and then we'll, we'll probably have more, more to talk about in our, in our discussion about it. So first about sidewalks. And again, this is a very fundamental definition to pedestrian safety is what is a sidewalk. So I put up the transportation code section right there. So it's that, that portion of a, of a street that is between a curb or lateral line of a roadway and the adjacent property line and an area intended for pedestrian use. But one of the questions that has come up several times is does a sidewalk have to be paved to be considered a sidewalk? And this is something we've um, been looking into over the past couple of years to really see if we can get a better definition in, on that. So there is nothing stating that a sidewalk must be paved, but there's also nothing saying that it doesn't have, that it doesn't, that every, that, yes, yeah, so there's not really anything stating specifically about if it has to be paved or not. Now, uh, just uh, we've had our uh, our staff, one of a, our staff, a lawyer on staff that we have at TTI look into this and look into some case law on this. And in a previous case law, it was found that a sidewalk does not necessarily have to be paved to be considered a sidewalk, um, at least as far as when you're using that as a defining what constitute a crosswalk. And you'll see why that's important when we get to the definition of a crosswalk. However, there is not, again, a clear definition of what an unpaved sidewalk would look like. So that's still one thing that we're uh, trying to work through and understand a little bit more ourselves. And then the next part, next issue is the cross the issue, the, what is the definition of a crosswalk? So the first part of the definition talks about a portion of a roadway, including an intersection that has pedestrian crossing by surface, surface, mar surface markings or lines. So this is a marked crosswalk. We all know what that looks like. That's pretty definitive and understandable. The part that gets a little, a little more confusing is when you get to the second section of that, which is that portion of a roadway at an intersection within the connections of the ladder lines of the sidewalks on each side of the roadway. So this again is why the definition of a sidewalk is so important to the definition of our crosswalk. And as we understand, and so the, the question becomes what forms that unmarked crosswalk or that second section there, section B. And Again, what really connects there is the connections of those lateral lines of the sidewalk across the roadway that forms a crosswalk, even though it may not be marked. So from the way we're interpreting that is to understand that that can include both paved and unpaved sidewalks. Um, and again, depending how exactly you define an unpaved sidewalk. Sorry, let me go back there. Yeah. So you can see why these def why the law gets very confusing. And this is a lot of what we talk about in our trainings. But we try to use as many examples as we can in our trainings to talk through this. And we talk through several examples and things like that. But I'm just giving you guys an overview here. So the final issue is a bicyclist on the sidewalk. And while I know this is the you should, we're presenting to the Pedestrian Safety Coalition, bicyclists are still very much part of that vulnerable user group um, along with pedestrians. And so we want to make sure we want. And so that's why they're still part of our training. Um, but also this, uh, the bicyclists on the sidewalk affects pedestrians since they're in that on that, that place where pedestrians are supposed to be. So the first thing is that as a bicycle is considered a vehicle in Texas. So that's the one, the first thing, the first point to start with. The next thing to talk, think about is that a sidewalk uh, is, defined, is defined as an area intended for pedestrian use. 
Now, it does not define who may use it, but it does define it as a place for, for pedestrians to be using. So obviously those things are somewhat in conflict with each other, right? So there's somewhat of a conundrum here for bicyclists on the sidewalk and how they're treated in the law, especially when we're talking about them approaching a crosswalk um, and then like when they're entering an intersection, for example. And so many of you are probably familiar with the Lisa Torres Smith Act from uh, 2021 that came into effect. And so I put the full thing here. I just wanted to point out a couple, a couple of sections. Um, and the main, uh, the first one is the first one bulleted here is, oops, in section two, sorry about that, that cause, um, that, that's talking about a motor vehicle causing bodily harm or uh, to a pedestrian, bodily injury to a, to a pedestrian or a person operating a bicycle in a crosswalk. So, and then, um, so when we asked our internal um, staff lawyer to look into this and understand the law and its intention. Um, the conclusion was that this somewhat indicate, this seems to indicate that the vehicle, the bicycle in that location um, would be treated more as a user of the sidewalk um, or, or as a, maybe as a pedestrian. Um, but, uh, but, in, but as we've learned through our trainings and also in, in our discussions with Sergeant Hewitt, um, there are some other legalities in here to keep in mind, which includes the um, the affirmative defense in section D there, where they're um, they're talking about the legality of the person using that using that place for walking movement or operation, and then also the cr criminal criminal negligence um, part of that as well. So this is where it starts to get a little bit more complicated. But so I want to introduce this to talk about what some of these interpretations and why these are are important. And we're hoping to hopefully get some clarification on these and and some initiatives that are going forward. Uh, so that that's really what I wanted to talk about in in this is just introduce the training, what we've done, where it's been, and some of the issues that have come up um, in regard um, during those trainings and in uh, how we're understanding the law. So I'm going to stop there. And then, um, Micah, are we going to go to have Sergeant Hewitt uh, talk for a few minutes? Yeah, that would be great. Um, unless, Joan, you had anything to add? You're good. No. OK, I'm good. Thank you. Perfect. Well, OK, thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, the invite. My name's Scott Hewitt. Um, a lot of my commentary, I think, will come in our, our moderated discussion. Uh, but I, I do want to commend the work that this coalition is doing and, and the TTI. A, a campaign like this, it's a public awareness campaign, but it's also a law enforcement awareness campaign. You know, in, in our line of work, we get pulled in, in many different directions. So when there's something, an organization like this that is drawing attention to a specific need, it makes the public aware, but it makes law enforcement aware as well. And, and something like this that has come along with training, training that's offered to law enforcement uh, is just phenomenal. Uh, so many law enforcement officers get trained in the transportation code and they get trained in crash investigation in their initial academy. And then they never get continuing education in those topics as, as, as crazy as that seems. They may go 20 years in their career and never get refresher training on some of these things. So the 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 things that the TTI is doing in this coalition with training for officers is, has been really, really amazing. Uh, I guess the other thing that this helps us keep in mind, and then, you know, I'm, I'm a transportation code guy, so definitions are important to me. The definition of traffic in the transportation code goes beyond motor vehicles and I think even in the law enforcement world, certainly within the general motor, motoring public's world, they think public highways are for motor vehicles, they're for cars. But our definition of traffic is much broader than that. It includes pedestrians and bicyclists and, and all these other road users. So um, what, the, what the coalition is doing to bring awareness to all these other folks who are lawfully using public highways is, is a, a great thing. So. Uh, I'm happy to be here, happy to lend my perspective from the law enforcement world. Uh, and as we get into to this discussion, I, I 
I will do my best to, to lend some insight from my side of the fence. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sergeant, for being here. Um, like I said, uh, we're really appreciative to have the law enforcement perspective. Um, it's something that in the past couple of years, I think that we've been um, having less of. And so we're really thankful for your presence. Um, and also thank you to uh, Neil and Joan for sharing your expertise and more importantly, your time on such an important topic um, and your insights in the pedestrian and cyclist safety world. Um, to kind of kick off our discussion, I'd like to start exploring some of the feedback um, from law enforcement officers who have been attending the training programs. You'd kind of mentioned some of the surveys and takeaways. What's kind of the most common feedback you've received about your trainings um, outside of um, those surveys? Yeah, so um, from our perspective, um, I think the most thing, mo um, one thing that's been coming up a lot is talking about some of the things we all know about that law enforcement is struggling with over the past few years, which of course is, the, is staffing issues, keeping enough staff you know, in there to do enough in, to do enforcement, because that's been an issue I've heard about from some agencies, but also um, having the time to have them take out to do training has been an issue too, I have found, um, where they're pulled in so many different directions. So even though they may say, yes, I want to register and come to your course, they get pulled off in another direction because of another thing that comes up. Now, granted, that's just part of the, of the law enforcement experience in some ways, but um, it's, it seems like that's more of a struggle recently. At least that's how, uh, but from what I'm understanding. Um, I also think that um, depending on where you are, there could be different amounts of support from either your, um, either your community for law enforcement, but also from um, the management at your enforce at your agency. And so I think that somewhat also affects some things as well. Um, I also another thing that had come up um, in a training um, this past year, which I had not considered as much, but make is a something very impactful, is the fact that many of these officers, when they're responding, to, especially to a severe crash that's involving somebody walking or biking, they may they're very likely going to have to testify in that case. So they're going to have to, they need to have as much information as possible when they go into that test te, into testifying to make sure they know. What they they know everything is correct what they understand from the law perspective is correct and all those different types of things so i think it just emphasizes more what what sergeant hewitt was already saying that you know having a, um as much information as possible to be able to uh go into those things as being informed as possible is is really a key thing there um and also there's a desire we hear see in our evaluations a lot and that's just unfortunately part of the the, the game is we hear they would love to see more details and more clarification on what some of these laws mean and how they're being interpreted. And so that's something that, and that's really how Joan and I became um, talking to Sergeant Hewitt is really trying to understand how DPS is looking at some of these same issues and trying to um, have those conversations about those interpretations of law and how we can make that a little bit more clear, clear for people um, that are out there doing that enforcement. Um, so that's what I could think of from my perspective. Joan, I don't know if you had anything else to add um, on top of that. Uh, yeah, just a couple of things. I guess um, specifically about the content, it seems like that um, unmarked crosswalks, that comes up a lot as being, wow, I didn't really understand unmarked crosswalks. So that's one particular issue that seems like officers are, their eyes are opened to the presence of and the existence of and how to, how to determine where those are. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about is that the right of way laws for micromobility um, and even bicyclists, but micromobility um, and bicyclists comes up as uh, confusing. The right of way laws surrounding those users seems to be um, something that I guess is confusing for, well, it's gray. So I guess, of course, it's going to be confusing. And um, I guess the final thing that I think is interesting is uh, some of the officers say, wow, everyone should be taking this class, not just officers. You know, we need to have others that are just learning to drive or just, you know, in their years of 
getting out and walking and biking more, understanding the laws surrounding that activity. So those are three other things I was thinking of. Awesome. But, um, and I'd be interested to hear Scott's thoughts on what he hears, because he does a, an amazing class on contributing factors and even um, on the transportation code. There's probably comments regarding pedestrian and bicycle safety that he's heard too. Sure, I, I hear a lot of the same issues that that you're discussing. The the unmarked crosswalk discussion. It always, you can see little light bulbs coming on in the class. It's just something they they've not, never thought about. But there are major implications for right of way when it comes to pedestrians. Of is there a crosswalk there or not? So the fact that there's one there, even if there's not paint, I mean that's something that that if you miss that as an officer when you're working that crash, you could you could get your contributing factors completely wrong uh, on the crash report. So yeah, that 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 education is, is and again, that they were told about unmarked crosswalks way back when in their training academy and it just it just didn't stick. Uh, and so coming back and having those conversations again, absolutely is, is imperative. Uh, you guys mentioned as well from a law enforcement perspective, when we work that crash, we submit a crash report, but there is a very real chance that we're going to be sitting in some type of civil deposition or at a criminal trial. And there's going to be somebody on the other side, you know, second guessing everything we've said and all of our opinions and, and a lot of the gray area we're talking about. That becomes very real to an officer who's sitting in the hot seat and, and trying to defend their position when there is some some legitimate gray area in the law where you can sort of interpret it as you'd like. And of course, the other side will always interpret it differently than than you're interpreting it. So uh, these conversations that are being had in these trainings and between agencies, I, I was so appreciative of you guys reaching out to us and collaborating with us on some of these gray areas to, to at least get to a point where we're all sort of consistently interpreting that stuff. Uh, no matter who's doing the training, I think that will help a lot if it's just consistently being taught a certain way. And that's a nice segue. I mean, obviously training is something that we can do and we have a role in public awareness, um, but what other roles, and this is particularly for um, Sergeant Hewitt, but Joan and Neil, you feel free to respond, but from your perspective, what role do you see public awareness campaigns and then these community engagement initiatives playing to support law enforcement to reduce the pedestrian and bicyclist injuries and fatalities? And then also kind of with that, how can law enforcement agencies as well as obviously like us um, do a better job of collaborating um, both local advocacy groups and law enforcement agencies to better um, see these initiatives forward? So we, we've kind of already discussed part of the way programs like this and initiatives like this support us because it it, it brings training and awareness within our community that, that this is a real issue. And that if there's some training that we can get to to refresh ourselves on the law, uh, that's always a good thing. And then when there is public awareness that comes along with a campaign like this, you know, our, our big tool, our mechanism for uh, contributing to particularly pedestrian safety is enforcement of the laws meant to protect pedestrians. Uh, ideally, before the crash happens, you know, that that proactive enforcement before the crash, that's that's how we're going to increase safety. So our mechanism is the citation, writing a writing a ticket when there are violations. And when the public is aware of an initiative and of a problem, it doesn't make them happy to get the ticket, but I think sometimes it helps them understand. They understand why we're doing what we're doing from an enforcement standpoint. Uh, so that that certainly helps. And and again, uh, as far as collaboration and working together, it, we've talked about that already as well. All of us just getting together and working through some of the hard issues, the the the, the questions to which there are not great or solid answers, so that at least we can we can come to our best our best conclusion and that we can consistently uh, teach that stuff uh, and, and just, just communication between between all the players in this world uh, are, are absolutely imperative and, and members of a coalition like this 
they're the boots on the ground. There are people within this organization that they they are the the population they're advocating for. They're they're pedestrians that they, they, they use the highways on foot. They're they're bicyclists. Uh, for many years, I, I rode a motorcycle, and I, I'll tell you, riding a motorcycle, you learn to be a very, very defensive driver. You, you just assume that everybody's going to pull out in front of you, that nobody's going to see you coming. I think it's the same way. If you're a pedestrian or if you're a bicyclist, you've got to defensively walk or defensively ride. Uh, anyone who who spent time in that community has a laundry list of close calls. They didn't actually get hit. There was not actually a crash, but they almost got hit. And, and so folks within this community can help us and law enforcement understand where those problem areas are all the times that that they were almost hit or had the close call. Uh, you know, we don't know about it because there was not a crash, but we need to know about it. We need to know that, that those dangerous things are happening and we can figure out why they're happening and maybe target some of our enforcement. So again, just that that exchange of information and communication just really, I think, can benefit both sides of the fence for pedestrian safety. Yeah, you said that we're boots on the ground, but I also see law enforcement officers as boots on the ground. <laughs> well, you're there's out a there lot of face boots. To face. Yeah, there's right. a lot of boots. Um, just being um, perhaps the, the first time someone might learn, oh, I'm not supposed to cross there. It's illegal to cross there. Mm -hmm. Wait, I didn't know that. And then you're able to educate. That's, that's um, a, such a valuable role for an officer um, to have is to be able to share, you know, here's the law and you know, here's material if you want to know more or, you know, that kind of thing, whether it's a citation or a warning or just, you know, a, a chance to communicate the laws with someone. I think that's a great benefit that law enforcement provides. I'm just going to kind of echo what they've already, Joan and Scott have already said, but I'll just add to that, that of course, being the outreach arm that you know TTI kind of uh, works, you know, and I and I lead is the Walk Bike Safe Texas initiative, and um, we try to do some of the things that have been talked about in here to make sure the edu the public has the education and knows about the laws as well, and that's sort of the intention of that grant, um, which also was sponsored by TxDOT. Thank you. <laughs> um, but then, um, you know, I'm also thinking about. Again, like Joan said, like so in our law enforcement trainings, we give them resources when they leave. So they leave with um, a stack of pamphlets that we give them as an example um, enforcement brochure that covers some of those some of those most most common things that they may see out there. And then that they can use that as information education because oftentimes law enforcement, like Joan said, are sometimes the first people that um, people encounter that tell them about the love of the law and what they should and should not be doing. Um, so we are very happy to be, help provide those resources to law enforcement. And, um, and again, it's really great to also hear from the law enforcement perspective that that's helpful for them. So that's all I was going to say. It must feel good to have that, that reinforcement, Neil, that your, your work is actually helping and turning the wheel forward. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. I have a gazillion questions for y'all, but I do want to make sure that I'm cognizant of time. So I do want to open it up for a couple audience members to ask questions. And if there are none, we can return to kind of all my questions. But I already see a hand. So there you go. So, Ricky, if you have a question, feel free to to ask our wonderful panelists. Hi, yeah. Um, so I'm Ricky Cardenas. Uh, I work for Eastern District. I previously worked for TechStock for six and a half years. I'm a bike rider and uh, I've actually been hit uh, by a driver. Um, and I have a, a question. This is something that I've heard uh, from a lot of bike riders and I've experienced it myself actually after being hit. Um, it, it, after being hit, um, the officer who responded, I believe it was a Harris County officer, um, it felt as though that maybe they were kind of had already um, maybe made up their mind as far as um, a little bit of blame and kind of you know, if it's, you know, the middle of the day, you know, pointing out, you know, well, you're not wearing high vis clothing and, and, you know, that sort of thing. Is there any training that goes in, in, into this program as far as not just the laws, but maybe how to, you know, treat each of the involved parties and, you know, make sure, you know, that everybody, you know, I guess kind of remains neutral until, you know, it's decided in the court or wherever it may be.
Um, I'll start with an answer, and then um, I'd also be interested in Scott and um, Officer Hewitt's perspective from that uh, law enforcement perspective. I know in our, and so there's not, we don't necessarily point it out in those direct terms in our training, um, although that's not a bad suggestion, um, to be honest. Um, but, uh, and I think this kind of goes back to something Sarah Shinit was saying earlier, when um, I know several times, you know, so I think some officers do come into a, some of our training somewhat skeptical sometimes, or just kind of like they're attending because their their leadership told them, they, okay, TTI is coming in during this training, you, you need to go. So they just go and they attend, not necessarily because they want to be there, but because they're being told to be there, right? And they, so there's somewhat, you can sometimes feel that skepticism from them, like, okay, I'm here and I want to get my T-Cole credit. But many, many times, more often than not, as those three hours of the training progress, we can definitely see that officer's knowledge and understanding and reception to the stuff we're talking about grow over that time, especially, you know, by the questions they're asking, by the responses they're giving, you know, when we're asking, because we have, at least in our training, we are training, we have lots of interaction with the, the law enforcement officers. So we make sure that there's lots of discussion happening and everyone understands the concepts fully. So I would say, May, again, maybe not a direct way to say that, but I think in some ways, people, officers that come to our training, I think most of them, if not all of them, come out of that with a much broader understanding of that and maybe a different way to understand and approach um, when they see it, when a crash happens, how do they uh, respond to it? And I think maybe some of that comes from the knowledge. When they have better knowledge of what they're talking about, they can be more confident in being out, going out there and and also being more open-minded about what are the circumstances of the crash and uh, how does the law how does the law involve that so yeah so I, I would just add to that uh, absolutely a crash investigation should be unbiased uh, an officer who comes into it should have the perspective of uh, i'm going to let the evidence speak for itself and the the obligations of the parties involved that should be dictated by the requirements of the law not the the officer's opinion of, of of what is safe or what they should have been wearing, uh, you know. So, um, you know, obviously that that is the ideal crash investigation from that perspective, not from a biased perspective. Uh, and again, you know, I mentioned this at the beginning, but I, I think even in the law enforcement world, we sometimes sort of fall into a misconception that that the roadways are for motor vehicles, that they get priority, and that everybody else just needs to get out of the way. And if you get yourself hit by a car, why didn't you get out of the way? You know, sort of that perspective. You know, that's not the correct perspective, but it, it, we do encounter it sometimes. Uh, so one thing we're trying to emphasize in our training, again, the definition of traffic, there's a lot of things out there that use this space to, to move about the state of Texas. And, and our opinions for crash investigation contributing factors, they've got to be based on everyone's requirements within the law. Were they where they were required to be doing what they were required to be doing? Were they equipped properly according to the requirements in the law? And if they were, they have legal standing to be there doing what they're doing. Uh, so uh, it, it's unfortunate that you had that experience. Uh, I'm sorry that you had that experience, but certainly that's not an ideal way to go about the crash investigation. Thank you. And Ricky, did you have any follow-ups or? Yeah, no, th just thank you. Thank you, you know, both for the answers. But um, just to kind of uh, reiterate is so this sort of thing that we're kind of discussing, that's not actually included in the training is what I'm hearing. So I guess maybe a follow up is, you know, can is, it, is there a way to this for this sort of thing to be added? Well, like I said, not a bad suggestion. So uh, we're about <laughs> to start our next year of trainings um, coming up. Um, Joan and I are for ours. And so we always do a yearly um kind of adjustments uh to based on either new laws that came into effect uh, based on our evaluations from the previous year things like that and so we're we are joe and i are actually in that process right now of making those final um thoughts about how we're going to change our content for next year so i think that's a great suggestion yeah thank you ricky for participating and asking questions um dexter i see your hand up as a as up as well and i'd love to hear your question because you're always very creative and i know you do all the well, walking audits so i'd love to hear your perspectives thank you very much uh both presenters thank you for being here 
my question uh, goes out to how there's, if there's any training at all on how to interact with the media, because when that officer presents a report right there on the scene, they give it to the news and the news uh, takes that framework and projects that to the community. And unfortunately, a lot of times that projection is, is that the pedestrian or the bicyclist was at fault. Is there any training or, or, or any concepts in future training to uh, better uh, uh, associate the media and the law enforcement officer reporting so that we don't have that uh, perceived bias? So Dexter, I, I would say that that's probably going to be agency specific. I, I know within DPS, most crash investigators they typically won't talk to the media. We have, you know, PIO officers and media folks who do get specific training and in, in how to interact with the media, how, how to present information in a way that that's not going to cause people to, to jump to conclusions or, or put information out there before we're sure about it. So uh, within our agency, that that's how we would handle it. We, we do have folks that have gone through specific training for that, but I think there there are certainly are some agencies out there who due to manpower or agency size, they just they don't have those people with a dedicated role. Uh, so I'm not aware of any other training that that goes into how to deal with the media, at, at least within my agency, aside from the, the folks who get the specific training for their media positions. I'm not sure about the, the class that Neil and Joan are doing. Yeah, no, we don't currently have anything that necessarily talks about that specifically. Um, I'm, I'm definitely aware of um, a, a, the talk about how we the media media can sometimes be a little bit biased in their representations of, of different crashes and how it can really change public perceptions. Um, that there's a uh, great work from Tara Goddard at Texas A&M actually who has looked into that several times and other people as well. So um, yeah, I mean, it's not something we currently do, but again, um, I'm open that this is a good suggestion to maybe make a mention of at the very least. Yeah. I, I bring this up because, and I think this was from some other trainings that you guys have provided, uh, where the reports come out, the pedestrian was uh, on the street, but they don't mention there was no sidewalk. Pedestrian was drunk. Well, obviously we can't fix that, but a lot of times uh, the pedestrian crossed in the middle of the, uh, of the block, uh, but uh, there was a bus stop right there and they'd have to walk a quarter mile from one end to the other and there was no other option there. The media does not present that. The reporting officer does not present that. And so we get the perception that the pedestrian is always wrong and that may or may not be true. Okay, thank you. And again, it's the one thing I just wanna mention, I, I've already mentioned it, I was gonna reiterate it as well. I really get um, and again, there's not a way to measure this specifically, but again, I really uh, just going back to those officers that I can tell sometimes are coming in very skeptical of the information we're giving them um, and what we're talking about. But again, for the most part, I can I can see it as those those three hours of training go through that they're getting a little bit they're they're understand they're there's new things coming to coming to them that they're not thinking of. And I think that starts to change perspective. So at least maybe there's, um, you know, more of that happen. Hopefully there's more of that happening as we get to more, to, to talk to more people, I guess is what I'm going to get at. Yeah. And we try to do a good job with the training material and curriculum to be extra mindful of, I guess, victim blaming for lack of a better term, just trying to keep away from any mention of that. So I also wanted to point out, so Scott had added in the, the chat, the collision, not accident. Um, so this changes the Texas codes to replace accident with collision. I know a lot of us in this room are aware of that change, but I think that when talking about, you know, media training and things of that nature and how we discuss it, I will tell you even at parties when someone's talking about that they were in an accident, it takes me all in my willpower not to correct them because, yeah. That's probably rude, but I do sometimes kind of like 
ease in there. I was in a room yesterday and it took everything. I literally made a face. <laughs> so I try my best, but I do think in terms of when we're speaking with people in the profession or just like tangentially, I, I think I usually see it mostly in the tangential world of like people just on the outskirts of our profession. Um, insurance agencies are one of them. They always say accident. And so oh, I, I was somebody's telling me it's not rude. So thank you. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think that correcting people in a positive way and just explaining to them the significance of why you would change it is definitely a good starter. But um, with that, I think that language is very important. So I think that how we're talking about this and also how we're approaching law enforcement both cohesively. I, I know we hadn't mentioned that, but I think that Joan and Neil, I really applaud you in how you've done that of approaching law enforcement and um, Sergeant Hewitt as well as approaching the advocacy community, because obviously in any sort of situation where lives are lost, there can there are lost, there can be tension. Um, they're very sensitive issues. And I really appreciate all all three of you for this um, very diplomatic approach of how you guys are doing things. Um, with that, I just want to open up for one more question because we are getting near and I want to be cognizant of people's um, time. Does anybody else have any questions? If not, I have one last question, but I want to give people a second to kind of think. Okay, well, I don't see any, so I'm going to be selfish and I'm going to ask my last question. And I hope this is a good closing question, but you know, we talk about language, we talk about training outside of training, and this is can be open, but particularly mm -hmm. for you, Sergeant Hewitt, um, what do you see as the biggest barrier, such as infrastructure or policy limitations that hinder enforcement agencies and enforcement of pedestrian safety laws? Um, and how do you balance these challenges with other public safety concerns, especially when resources are limited, as Joan Neal mentioned? Uh, so I, I see two, I think, two primary barriers. The first, I think, is just manpower. Uh, almost across the board, police agencies in Texas are shorthanded. So anyone you talk to in the law enforcement community, everybody is trying to hire more officers. They're pulling folks from patrol, from traffic enforcement duties to, to handle call volume. And, you know, obviously calls for service and, and public dangers are always going to take priority. That, that's where the resources are going to go. But unfortunately, a lot of agencies don't have resources to, to focus on patrol. So uh, some agencies don't have a traffic patrol division. They just don't have officers that are dedicated to, to enforcing traffic laws. And, and again, th that's where we can have the greatest effect on pedestrian safety is, is enforcing the laws that, that are meant to protect pedestrians. So I think manpower is probably the number one issue uh, that, that agencies are facing. And, and then I think the other thing is education of the officers, uh, you know, even within traffic units, there, there's a significant focus on speed enforcement, on, on some moving violations. And for officers that haven't gone through the types of training that we're talking about here, the, the pedestrian laws are, are kind of way back in the recesses of their brain. Yeah, they learned them at some point, but they, they just, in a lot of jurisdictions, it, there's just not an emphasis on that, on that type of enforcement. So, uh, that's why things like this are so important. It, it brings it to the forefront. It gets officers the information they need to take proper enforcement action. Uh, so I, I would say those two things, manpower and then just a, a lack of, of education or training on this particular issue within the law enforcement community. Uh, both of those things are, are barriers to, to our enforcement efforts. Uh, I would say there's might be communication barriers barriers as well between the law enforcement agency and whoever the jurisdiction is that owns the infrastructure because the law enforcement agency may not have a direct line of contact to the engineers, you know, planners, designers of the infrastructure. But it seems like if we can get those two groups talking more, we might have, um, I don't know, a little... They can understand each other's side better. They can make changes that would 
you know, improved safety for people walking and biking, whether that's infrastructure or education or enforcement, you know, just being able to keep that communication line open. Uh, I, I hear communication is definitely, I think, the key. Yes. Um, with that, I do want to, I there's a, want to highlight a question in the chat. Um, Carla had asked if the law enforcement training is free and available to the public. And that's a Jonah Neal question for sure. Yeah, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, so yeah, the law enforcement training is completely free. It's funded by TxDOT. Um, so that pay to so that the grant that we have through TxDOT does pay for all of our travel and all of our time to conduct the training, create the training, create the resources, provide resources, all that. Um, in terms of being free available to the public, we really do these trainings geared towards the law enforcement since that is the target audience. Um, most of the times we do hold them. Um, that's our, at least our approach the past few years has been to partner with an agency and um, have hold a training there. And then they invite law enforcement from their agency as well as surrounding agencies to come and do the training. Um, and one piece of feedback we received from law enforcement was specifically on that was they really liked the the open dialogue they they would have of a room of other fellow law enforcement officers um, so they could talk about the issues in a more open environment um, with and then and be able to ask us questions, for example, uh, where they have a, a point of clarification or something like that. So um, while we have at some time, some points earlier on had members of the public, you know, in attendance to kind of be there. Uh, we found it works best and it's more, most comfortable for the officers to be there in a room with people that are just in the law enforcement community for the most part. Although like we have had TxDOT um, people come and uh, join our join our trainings here and there as well. I guess that's probably the, the main exception to that. Makes sense, especially with the limited time of the officers trying to kind of accommodate their schedule more than for the public. But um, thank you both Joan and Neil and Officer Hewitt. I really appreciate all of y'all's time. Um, I did want to highlight also in the chat, if no one got a chance to look at it, um, Kristen Rosenthal had um, from NHTSA has uh, shared a resource that I think is really important um, for everybody. We talk about communication and NHTSA has some really great resources. Um, so if you guys want to check that out, that's really great. Um, that looks like it's from the UNC, um, as well as NHTSA themselves have a lot of great resources um, on pedestrian engagement and tactics and things of that nature. Um, and with that, it's a great uh, plug and segue into a NHTSA webinar that is a must go to and we think you might be interested. Um, so all those who are already on a webinar, NHTSA is um, showcasing Pedestrian Safety Month um, with materials that have been developed to promote pedestrian safety. Um, and this webinar will be on September 26th at 12 p.m. Central Time. And NHTSA is focused on creating human-centric and community-oriented approaches and using resources and messaging to promote safer places for all um, to walk, bike, and roll. And as a special plug, Ben will be leading um, part of that with the Texas um, Pedestrian Safety Coalition being highlighted. So it's a special, special plug for us in a 60 minute webinar, along with other represent representatives of the National Center of Safe Routes to School, the government uh, Governor's Highway Safety Association, and then also Disability Rights Washington and NHTSA leadership. So I'm going to drop that link in the chat for y'all, um, for y'all to be able to join that and continue learning. But, oh, Ben did actually. And I really appreciate all of y'all's time. And look at that, 259 on the dot. Look at that efficiency. Um, but if y'all have any follow-up questions, um, you can always send them to me personally and I can speak with Joan and Neil. Um, we work on lots of projects together and I love any opportunity to pester them. Um, and they have a lot of connection with um, Sergeant Hewitt. Or if you want to reach out to Joan and Neil directly, feel free to do so. TTI um, is always open. I'm willing and we're really thankful for all the funding from NHTSA and TxDOT for all of these uh, pedestrian safety initiatives. So with that, thank you guys for joining us. Um, Officer Hewitt, thank you again for representing the law enforcement voice and Neil and Joan for all the work you guys are doing in our